So last time I talked about Sabine Hassenfelder's argument against free will and for determinism, and I explained why that argument fails and fails badly. This time I want to give a historical example of a similar argument. Her argument actually parallels this argument in interesting ways. It's David Hume's argument against miracles in the uh, 18th century. So I want to talk a little bit about Hume and how that parallels Sabine Hassenfelder and how we can kind of see these trends and, and learn from this. So David Hume was a philosopher and uh, historian, a Scottish philosopher historian in the 18th century. In 1748, he wrote a book entitled An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. And section 10 of that book uh, was entitled Of Miracles. And in Of Miracles, Hume attacked miracles very strongly and argued that we really can't know that they ever really existed, that there ever, ever really was a miracle. Um, so he's casting doubt on miracles. And Hume's work here is often presented as kind of a you know, challenge, obviously a challenge, a, a brilliant philosopher uh, bringing out evidence against miracles. So it's a challenge to religious people, especially Christians. Miracles, of course, have always been important historically in the Christian faith, uh, especially in the New Testament, but Old Testament as well. So it's a challenge to Christians, right? Um, they reeled against this, right? It challenged Christian sensibilities. Well, not really. Um, Christians in the decades and even up to a century before 1748 had been growing increasingly skeptical of miracles. And there was a vigorous debate at that time, especially in England in the first half of the 18th century, about miracles and to what extent that they occurred and so forth. Uh, a popular doctrine, and still popular today, is called cessationism. And cessationism is the doctrine that the miracles that you see in the New Testament um, were for the New Testament times only, and they don't continue. And so we don't really have miracles today like they had then. Don't expect to see people getting healed and so forth. Um, that doctrine kind of lets you know what was going on with Christians. They were increasingly skeptical. There were others who even argued that there really aren't any miracles, uh, weren't any miracles except for the original creation event. Christian Wolf, for example, uh, a leading uh, theologian, a uh, Lutheran theologian in the first half of the 18th century, uh, was made strong arguments against miracles. Um, because they are a sign of brute force, they're not a sign of wisdom, was kind of the, the approach he had. So Hume was really adding fuel to a fire that was already going. It wasn't like he was some intellectual revolutionary with this new powerful argument. Uh, casting, you know, a uh, challenge to Christian sensibilities. His argument failed badly, but at the time he tickled people's ears and it was influential. There were critics, but they didn't really carry the day. Uh, eventually he won out, so to speak, in, the term, in terms of at least the elite thinking, uh, because it was, the elite thinking was already somewhat there, as I, as I said. So I'm not going to go through all the details of how, the, uh, how Hume's argument fails, but at the core of the argument, which is important here, is that he pitted natural law against miracles. Uh, he noted that, well, a miracle is a suspension of natural law and intervention against natural law by definition, right? So if you hear about a miracle, you should compare the evidence for that miracle with the evidence for natural law. They are pitted against each other in Hume's argument. And this is important because it's a false dichotomy. Um, miracles, yes, they are an intervention against natural law, but they also require natural law. They require a uniform experience. That's how we know that it's a miracle. You need a world that has a uniform flow to it. And so it's really much deeper and more complicated than the way that Hume was laying things out. Um, I, I want to quote from John Ehrman's book. John Ehrman's book. Uh, Ehrman wrote this book about 20 years ago, Hume's Abject Failure, where he analyzed Hume's argument and really demolished it, took it apart. And Ehrman writes, I find it astonishing 
how well posterity has treated of miracles, given how completely the confection collapses under a little probing. So he's being pretty frank here. No doubt this generous treatment stems in part from the natural assumption that someone of Hume's genius must have produced a powerful set of considerations. But I suspect that in more than a few cases it also involves the all too familiar phenomenon of endorsing an argument because the conclusion is liked. And that last sentence is important here. Because a conclusion is liked. So what do you, I want to make three points to take away from Hume. Very smart person very bad argument, well accepted, mostly or at least likely because it was tickling the ear. It, he spoke to the times. Because that's what's happening, I believe, with the Hassenfelder uh, argument as well uh, against free will. Uh, again, we see, as I talked about last time, very smart person, very bad argument, and what I didn't talk about so much was the, the, the acceptance and the reception of it. Uh, it is uh, accepted by many people. If you want to have evidence of that, look at our YouTube page. There's a lot of likes. It's a lot of views. And the comments, a lot of positive comments. A lot of constructive, admiring, approving comments. It's She also, another parallel with Hume here, is that she does, does that same um, opposition of natural law with, in this case, free will. So she's butting up against each other, natural law and free will. You either have one or you have the other. Um, and she frames it just the way, in the same way as uh, Hume framed his argument. And you know, arguments are often won or lost in the way that they are framed. And that's one of the takeaways here. You, we need to be careful not to go along with the argument and then argue at some later stage, but look at the framing of the argument. That's the key. These are false dichotomies. You, you, you don't have to have one or the other. And if you don't see that, you will get swept away. So the framing is important, and we see this, this interesting trend here of very smart people proposing, and really very confidently proposing, ridiculous arguments and then the argument is well accepted and carries the day so hopefully Hassenfelders will not be as influential historically but it certainly um, is popular with a lot of people that's it for this time religion drives science and it matters